after these two heroes, uh, Michael Noll and uh, Frieda Nake, we go back to the uh, science world, the art historic science world. I'm looking forward to Grant Taylor. He is um, he has a doctorate in, in art history and is specialized in the history of early digital computer art. And uh, he made uh, several important uh, publications about this field. Today he is director of creative arts and professor of art and art history at Lebanon Valley uh, College in Pennsylvania. Grant will give a presentation first and then we'll open up the discussion. Grant, uh, where are you? Would you please come to stage to me? Ah, yeah, he is. Uh, it's really a big honor to have you here and I'm really looking forward to your presentation. And I would ask you, when you have finished, uh, when you bring up your guests, that you turn up uh, the clocks to 20 minutes, that you will also stay in time, which would be wonderful. Thanks. No problem. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Susan. And uh, I just want to say how amazing it was to have a Michael Knoll uh, in that video because he rarely does uh, kind of public statements. Uh, so, uh, Margaret, that was such a great job to, to edit that together. And it was a real treat for the entire audience uh, to see him and then, of course, uh, Frida Naki. Uh, only 20 minutes earlier. So uh, what I want to do today is, um, you know, when, when Susan asked me what, what I wanted to do, what I really was thinking about at the time was trying to join the uh, contemporary practice of generative art with the historical, and then at that same time, uh, think about the legacy uh, of Herbert Franke. Uh, because he is a big hero of mine, and I know a lot of people in the room, uh, his work is, is fundamental to their research, especially in art history. So, as you can see, I'm saying predicting an expanding medium, that's after one of the titles of his uh, articles in Leonardo, very important. So, the impetus for today is really about the, the different headlines that we find uh, are surrounding uh, art and AI and generative art generally. There is a real correlation between the way that the culture or journalists react to the artists of today like they did uh, in the 60s and 70s, which is to say that there's a question that is prompted towards the artist yesterday and today around the future. So what is the future of art? What is the future of computer art? What is the future of AI art? What is the future of, future of generative art? So there was a burden of the future on the artists uh, within this discipline that was not necessarily the case in, uh, in traditional art. So you don't think of um, a journalist asking uh, a painter, you know, what is the latest material science in acrylic polymers? It's just not something we think about. But in the discourse surrounding generative art or digital art or computer art, it is at the core. So I want to talk about that today. So what is this futurism? And uh, let's go ahead and have a look. So again, as I said before, uh, for me, uh, Frank here is a, uh, is a futurist in the sense the true sense of the word. So he is both um, a theorist, a practitioner, uh, but he's also got these other dimensions, right? Um, both as a physicist, but also as a science fiction writer. So a futurist is someone who is trying to predict the future, right? Someone who is looking outward and um, predicting what will come. And if you look at... Um, Franca's work, you'll, you'll see futurism or the notion of the future embedded in all of it. Uh, so I've got on, the, on uh, your right there some of his key science fiction uh, texts and of course The Orchard Cage is going to be performed on Saturday night. Uh, but for me, what is so important to me and many of the art historians in the audience is the 1971 Computer Graphics Computer Art, which is a foundational text. Uh, what is so remarkable about this is that he has taken the expanded form of uh, artists using the computer, mathematicians, engineers, technologists, 
from around the world in the, in the um, industrial nations, and he's tried to put that together into some form of narrative, a kind of a categorization, if you like. So he categorizes and breaks it up. And if you look at that text, you know it's virtually got every kind of practice that is operational in the world at the time, which is quite a feat. Stefan talked about generative photography, for example, and it's in there. Um, analog um, computing that Margaret talked about uh, recently is in there. So it's a key text. So for me, um, he is the epitome of this, this type of futurist. So if we look at futurism more generally, uh, when we think of it, we often think of it in terms of illustration, right? That these uh, comic books, funny uh, illustrations that come out of, the, uh, out of the 50s that looked at what the future was going to be like, what, how this technological reality that is in front of us. And so um, Radabau's work is great. Um, as, as I showed in the title, we had um, um, Artsy Beskov, which is another illustrator from the American tradition that tried to imagine futures. And we know when we go back and look at these, it's fun because a lot of it was predictive and some of it was way out. So um, in, this, in this example of how we understand the future, it's normally a techno-utopianism. So um, we have things like on the right here, we've got uh, push-button education, which, of course, materialised uh, fully after COVID, where we've got students using mathematics and having uh, some kind of technology in front of them and being aided by the teacher who is, is remote. Um, on the right, of course, uh, we have uh, self-driving cars. It's been imagined in the 1950s. And the family, nuclear family, is, is playing chess or checkers there while the, the, the self-driving car is doing its work. So what we have in this understanding of the techno-optimism is also the doomsday catastrophe. So we, we both see a future where things, uh, robots, are doing something for us but at, at the same time, we can see the impending ecological disaster. So often we'll, it'll be about uh, space travel to Mars to get away from a, a crumbling, um, disastrous uh, ecological system uh, in, in, on Earth, or there'll be all sorts of things. So we have, um, obviously, the robots, but we have living underwater or living in bubbles often, which is to protect us from the impending doom of uh, tomorrow. So we've got doomsday catastrophe on one hand and the optimism of the next. And this is all during the uh, atomic or space age, right? So a great time of uh, imagining the future, imagineers. Now, when we think of futurism, we think of text, right? I'm just putting together some of the golden age texts from the, the um, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Many of you will recognize these texts. So they are theorists coming out of social sciences that are speculating on what is coming down the track for us. You can see Future Shock there by the Tofflers. You can see Marshall McLuhan's uh, text, which uh, everyone's read, of course. Daniel Bell, The Limits of Growth from the uh, Rome Club. These are all key texts by um, theorists who are trying to predict the, the future. Now, the, the prediction of the future has been around for six millennia, right? So we've got soothsayers, we've got diviners uh, looking at animal entrails to, to try and predict what's going to happen in the future. So it is something that is at the core of the human experience to do that. Um, we get more serious about predicting the future when there is a technological advancement that is explosive. So during the 50s and 60s, we obviously have the mainframe. The mainframe develops and we, we have this explosion of futurist texts. We are living through that today with AI. Again, we have an amazing amount of futurist texts. So these are just New York Times bestsellers. But if I was to catalogue all the futurist texts that we've, has been written the last decade, um, you know, we're, we're getting into the 40 publications. So you can see some of these. A lot of you will uh, recognise some of the key futurists. Uh, Ray Kurtzell, 
of course, wrote a classical text for us, which I'm going to talk about in, the, in a minute. Um, but he, he is at the center of the debate on AI. So we've got this uh, new, uh, this perennial spring in AI happening right now. And to concurrent with that is these futurist texts that we see uh, all the time. So there is a, a desire for the kind of all-knowing, right? So what is going to happen to our future? Now, the d difference, I think, here is that uh, in, in computer art discourse or digital art discourse or generative art discourse, um, we have a, a machine that does predict as well. So we have a predictive technology. So at the core of um, uh, machine is the notion of, of the desire for machine learning. So even in the first instance uh, where we have the computer emerge on the cultural stage, it is a predictive element, right? So the journalists are asking um, the computer scientists, can it predict the future? So I've got J.W. Forrest, Forrester here. He is my favorite computer scientist. I've got a lot of computer scientists that I love, but I just adore him because if you've seen, I, I, I ask you to go on YouTube and watch videos of him uh, from this age, from, uh, from the 50s. And he's, he's just wonderful at showcasing the computer to a general audience. And he's very interesting in the fact that he's showing the potential creative element uh, of, of the uh, computer. So we've got the, World War, uh, the Whirlwind 1 console there. This is 51. It's during the first uh, televised CBS documentary where he shows what the computer uh, is able to do. And you can see footage of that uh, on, on YouTube. And then later on, he's still working at MIT. He's still in, in, uh, you know, in charge of the, the major computer systems there. He, he uh, develops World One, the computing program that was designed to predict the future. So take analysis based on um, you know, what's happening to our resources and predict what's going to happen. Is, Poverty, widespread poverty going to de develop? What's pollution going to do in terms of the statistical or historical data as it develops? And you can see on the right there, um, we have, this is a, a great documentary too, if you want to watch it on, it's ABC, Australian ABC does this um, documentary and it's showing uh, the graphing of that, that program, predicting that the world will end in uh, 2040. So some things actually happened, others didn't. Uh, but there is a belief that we will run out of uh, resources and the civilization will come to an end um, by, uh, by 2040. So um, the other predictive element we have here is that uh, there's a cultural element to it as well. So our first foray into culture is that we see that... Um, that we have the UNIVAC uh, predicting rightly the uh, election uh, from 1952. They believe that, in fact, um, that Stevenson would win. The computer correctly predicted Eisenhower, but they wouldn't, uh, wouldn't share that on air. So there's a, a great moment, cultural history, where the computer is right and makes a fool out of, of man. So um, that, that's, that's the element that we're, we're dealing with, that it's, it's a predictive technology. I'm going to get going here. Um, and our, our first artworks that come out of, um, out of the mid-century uh, you know, military industrial complex um, are really based on predictive uh, technologies, uh, specifically ballistics. So on the left here, we have our, our award-winning art uh, that's coming out of computer, uh, coming out of the Ballistics Research Laboratory, and it's projecting the, um, the, the ricochet of, of ballistics. And that, in fact, come, becomes a, a second award-winning piece of art in, in our history, and it, that was part of the Computer and People publication. So I want to now turn, if that's the first computer art uh, uh, winning art that's b based on predictive uh, models for uh, ballistics, we, we now return here to uh, our first kind of foray, foray into uh, 
the, the gallery situation. So we saw uh, Mike Knowles talk about this uh, exhibition at Howard Wise. And what I'm trying to do here is show you some of the, the responses. And you can see that the wave of the future uh, crashes significantly at Howard Wise. So what we've got in, involved in this is a discourse that is centered around future, around futurology. So if we look at all the, the, the text in the last 50 years, we'll find that it, it is presumptuous in terms of what has been asked. And so if we look at it, we can see um, that, that a lot of it is our first exhibitions, Cybernetics, Serendipity, Art and Technology at LACMA, are all based on, on what is going to uh, eventuate. In fact, many of the artists in this room that are pioneers wrote a, a text that were predictive. So um, I'm thinking of you, Anne, when you wrote your text about where will the computer be in 20 years. You wrote that, I think, in 2006. I think Joan Truckenborg also writes something, and she's in the room. It was all based on this predictive future. So. Like then, today, the, the, the generative artist has those elements involved. Now, by the time we get to the 70s, we have our key texts that become almost futurist. So they're talking about computer art, but they're also um, talking about the art that has been produced, and that becomes emblematic of the future. So Douglas Davies, the artist drawings in the, in the room, will really love this work. I love this the pickover visions of the future. I'm going to run through these as I've got about three minutes left. But what we're starting to see is a convergence of futurism, the text, and uh, discourse or practice. And then, as I said before, um, Kurzweil's Intelligent Machines, and if you haven't read this book, it's a classic where futurist, a futurist author is actually using computer art. We see... Uh, Harold Cohen's work here, and um, Colette and Charles Baguette's. The, these texts are in there. So they are actually directly interfacing with futurism. And of course, um, Kurzweil has continued to go on there uh, in terms of writing futurist work. So I'm going to finish off with this uh, because I think I've got two minutes left. I'm going to keep it within that. I'm going to finish off on a contemporary um, artificial intelligence AI generative work uh, by um, uh, Pierre Piers. His work is really interesting because it works on this futurist tendency, right, the, uh, to divine. So he's looking at um, notions of how the markets behave. So uh, predictive uh, modelling, right, um, Predictive simulations are used in financial models all the time. And here we see a crypto image or crypto charts being uh, um, mysticized in a way. The esoteric information of predicting becomes visualized in, in his work. And so um, what we start to see is the, the reflection by the artist on this esoteric or mysticism of the desire to predict uh, one's future. And the, this divining nature, or the, to divine the future, was central uh, to one important artist that I just want to finish on, and that was uh, Roman Verosco, who we lost this year. And this work reminds me of a lot of his work. Divination is a series that he also did, where he was predicting um, futures in, in, in a similar mystical way. So I'm going to finish with a quote from uh, Roman Verosco, who, as, as I said, we lost this year. But I asked him about the notion of the future in his work. And he said that um, the predictions of today, what we think about today is going to come tomorrow, um, is more important about the reality of tomorrow, which I, I think is really wise. And um, it's just so Verosco. So I'll finish on that. I know that Hans was a good friend of Verosco and, and, and may share his uh, remembrance to, uh, about his relationship with Roman. But thanks again, and I'll bring the panellists up.